Oh, hey guys. How are you doing? Is everyone all right? I've added to the Christmas decorations. I figure I'll add a few more every day that we end up doing this because I think if I just fully put the tree up and it feels kind of appropriate that they're all balanced on my box of loo roll that I accidentally bought in. Well, I didn't accidentally buy loo roll. You don't just well I accidentally bought 48 rolls in January even though there's only two of us that live in the house and one of us is imaginary and um uh now that seems like great for you from what on earth is the point of my existence and how am I going to exist as a person <laughs> if this carries on to that general feeling of well it can't get that bad can it but uh Hmm. God, YouTubing's difficult, isn't it? You just have to keep talking with no input from anybody else. I've got newfound respect for teenagers. Um, yes, because I just did open the door. That's what that lean forward was, where you probably got like a load of double chins in the camera. Um, I wish they did a webcam up high on a stick so I could all be like, oh, hello, look at me from above, instead of all this neck action. Anyway, thanks for coming back. I, uh, I'm glad you liked it yesterday. Oh, it does say my connection is unstable. Mate, it's not just the connection, it's the bloody woman in the video too. Please wait while we try to reconnect you. I don't know why it's being weird. Oh, is that better? Are we alive again? Yeah? The little thing's gone telling me that the connection was unstable, so hopefully that means everything's happy. I like that it says unstable. That's that's a really nice way to describe this. It's not like, this connection should. It's like, look, the connection's having a difficult time. Just bear with it. It's, it's not used to this level of social anxiety. Um, cool. So, yeah, this is my reindeer. I put this out because somebody yesterday said the tinsel was sad and I kind of agree having watched the video back. So I've added these dangly people, um, they're cute. And I've put some more tinsel coming down around the loo roll and the reindeer and then some dangly bits. So hopefully that's pleased you in terms of decorations. I'll try and just, maybe I'll just put the whole fucking tree up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right, well, I thought we'd read three chapters today because I read through the chapters and I was like yeah three seems fair I think they're a bit shorter than yesterday's chapters so we'll read those so um Mary Coronamus yeah Qu Quarimus social distancing well no there's I can't think of a pun um but uh yeah I think Look, if people aren't here now, they're not coming, are they? Shall we read? So yesterday's chapters, I'm sure you've read them. If you haven't, I don't know. There's nothing I can do about that. Go and read them. Um, so we'll go for chapter three, shall we? There's chapter three of the silly book. Sitting staring at the phone wasn't getting any more logical. It wasn't going to ring. The fact that she knew this with such certainty spoke volumes about the reality of the current situation. The world was over. She fingered the receiver, holding it up to her ear for the millionth time, only to not hear the dialing tone once again. It was time to accept the conclusion that longing for contact was not helping. Hamish had shuffled out of the house before they'd eaten lunch, mumbling something about his fishing rod. Since he'd left, Sarah had been sat in the hall on the carpeted floor by the phone table in the increasingly chilled air of the afternoon. She knew if she got up and did something, the life and warmth would find her limbs once again, but she couldn't pick herself out of the mental funk. Oh my god, anyone else just <laughs> this is a bit too close for home? <laughs> Should we just find a different book? Oh. The hypnotic pull of the silent phone on a lovelorn English woman is too strong to be broken with willpower alone. Her mind wandered aimlessly round erratic memories of the busy unreality of the past few days, trying to find a semblance of normality. These ramblings inevitably brought her back to Hamish and the night of the candles and the woomph noise. One of the benefits of this apocalypse thing seemed that to be that they'd somehow managed to hold things together. Good, I'm glad everything's going along. I'm just checking your messages just in case anybody's going, we can't hear you or do something else. Um, good, you can hear. Lovely, 
fingered is funny. Fingered is always funny. Never apologize for finding the word fingered funny. Every time she looked at him, she saw the reflection of 49 candles in his eyes, the visible sagging of his shoulders as she'd broken him. She felt sick and empty thinking about it. How he was still sticking around, she had no idea. She wasn't sure she'd have been able to do the same in his shoes. Misguided chivalry, she supposed. No man in the Stuart clan would walk out on a woman in the middle of an apocalypse, even if her recent behaviour rivalled a dung beetle for sheer depths of shittiness embraced. I don't know how to fix this, she said out loud into the still room. That was the most disconcerting thing about this Armageddon world. Everything was so still. So, so still. The air seemed listless, as though every movement through it was an inconvenience. The rivers were moving, but petulantly slowly. If the trees had eyes, they'd have rolled them at the breeze. Sarah had always imagined the end of the world would have bodies everywhere and decimated buildings. Come on, where were the zombies? It also seemed categorically unfair to have to deal with the end of an eight-year relationship as well as the end of the world. Most people are allowed to deal with heartache without also having to attend apocalypse committee meetings with the rest of your half-baked village. Not you, Sarah Gilmore. You really know how to jump headfirst into a mess, don't you? Tears took her by surprise and a lump caught the rhetorical question in her throat. She frowned back the tears and her hands twitched for the phone receiver again. I'm not sure even you can reasonably blame the end of the world on yourself. Not even you can have that much residual guilt. I was practising the Scottish accent. Is it? Is it horrible? Is there any Scottish people listening that are like... <laughs> I've practised that one line. I don't think I can do any of the other lines in a Scottish accent, but I did give that one a go, just in case. <laughs> it's like the one accent I really, really can't do. I don't know why I picked that one. Um... Yeah, okay, it's not a Scottish accent. Okay, cool, right, we won't, <laughs> we won't worry about doing that again. I'm not sure you can reasonably blame the end of the world on yourself. Not even you can have that much residual guilt. Hamish's voice. To say it broke in on her scene would be unfair. It wrapped itself into the gaps where her thoughts weren't. He had a lovely voice. She'd always thought that. It was just on the right side of gravelly, like a hot chocolate, but with bits of broken up crunchy in it to keep you interested. People were always a little surprised when they first heard Hamish's voice. He had a soft Scottish hint to his accent. <laughs> he really did. <laughs> Which became remarkably broad when he was in the company of his brothers and father. Sarah smiled despite herself, remembering her introduction to Hogmanay. It was so very, very different to the stale party she had always attended with her parents. It won't ring, he continued, Scottishly. It wouldn't have rung before, and it certainly isn't going to ring now it can't ring. It's best you just stop staring at it. I know, I know. I don't know what I'm waiting for. She eased her stiff joints and made to stand up. It's natural to be worried about them. He busied himself with his fishing rod so he wouldn't have to make eye contact with her. He'd avoided it since Sunday night and was finding it made things slightly easier on his delicate mental balance. I'm sure... I'm sure they're fine. She wanted to hug him. She wanted to fling herself across the room and throw her arms around him and just make him forgive her. Just hold on and, and force forgiveness out of him until he had no choice left except her. She didn't move. Her foot twitched imperceptibly, but she stayed exactly where she was, feeling achy and pathetic. It was hard to seek forgiveness for something you hadn't been blamed for. I know, I know. Well, I just... It would just make it easier if I could speak to them. They won't have changed their minds. Her back frosted. They might have. Her voice was too shrill and she knew it. Not an attractive tone. How long would it take him to realise that and find some other post-apocalyptic broad who didn't have the family from hell and the voice of a rodent? She flinched. Not even comfortable with unspoken disloyalty to the parent she was currently blaming for everything. Maybe this has all been a bit of a wake-up call. You think the apocalypse is a modern day cure for racists? Sarah felt the familiar panic start to form, like plastic static on her neck and up into her hairline. Well, if this doesn't work, what will? <laughs> now she sounded childish. This was barely better than the shrew. I, I just... You just wanted to phone them and tell them you were going to marry me anyway? He finally lifted his eyes to hers and let them hang there. 
Sarah felt like a cartoon character, her idiot mouth gaping and her eyes panicked and strained. Yes, she faltered. No. He turned in a slow circle like the death rattle of a plastic bag in the wind. Hamish! Adding desperate to her vocal range, Sarah stood up. Hamish, wait! I am, he said, smiled briefly and walked away. That's chapter three. Let's see what you lot are talking about. Oh, you mean you weren't Scottish. Right, okay. <laughs> you meant like yeah great accent it's not scottish though but well done on doing something done with your voice um well i think maybe it's just easier for all our ears if i don't do hamish's scottish accent. i will practice look if this lockdown turns into a four month thing i'll i've got nothing else to do every single good thing that was happening to me this year has disappeared in in a weekend so if i you know maybe duolingo would start teaching us accents that would be good i've been learning uh, spanish for a while um all right okay chapter four we ready everybody's sitting comfortably by day six of the apocalypse they had pretty much all agreed that the biggest problem was the lack of death People were starting to get fractious. Even the stalwart Christians were showing signs of noticeable anxiety about the length of time between the end of the world and the appearance of their Lord and Saviour tell them what to do and shepherd them to a chaise long with a few grapes. Mrs Hemel had written a strongly worded letter to the BBC and had been very close to sending it before Mr Baxter pointed out that the BBC probably had little to do with the whereabouts of Christ. No one was really sure where the points of view were still running as they'd not had power since the end of time. They'd not had time either. The missing Jesus was a cause for some concern at the first meeting of the Apocalypse Committee at the Village Hall. Irish Shoe caused violence to break out by suggesting that perhaps Jesus was just working his way down the country and that really six days was quite reasonable if you considered that he was probably going to do the cities first. Mr Arthur, first name also Arthur, asked her if Jesus would be visiting all the towns in size order. Mrs Shue said that she assumed so as that's how she would do it and the two of them really were very similar. Mr Arthur responded that both parts of that sentence were ridiculous but mainly the logistics part. He said he'd driven a lorry for 38 years and the biggest city's first was the most illogical assumption possible. He said any traveller worth their salt knew you should plan your route geographically. Beryl from the village shop slapped him around the face for suggesting Jesus was a gypsy. Iris counted that if you didn't start with the biggest place, how would you know where to begin the tour? Everyone agreed that the country's extremities were no place to begin a mission of salvation. Scotland was not designed for such prestige. Iris again asserted that she felt they would be reached in due course once the good Lord had reached them on his list. Unfortunately, Beryl's hand got away with her again when she worked out that this meant that the nearby village of Staple Grove, Norton Fitzwarren's rival parish, would be visited first, despite the fact Norton Fitzwarren had twice beaten them at the Southwest Floral Village Awards between 2006 and 2009. Beryl was a while... Beryl was one among many villagers who might have to seriously rethink their religion should Jesus choose to visit Staple Grove first, despite the differences between the two villages being barely perceptible to an outside eye. At this point, Nigel decided he ought to take Beryl home as there were whisperings about apocalypse fever. Mr Baxter wrapped Rufus's leash firmer around his hand. With Beryl and Nigel gone, it was felt that perhaps they should put the issue of what to do until Jesus got there to one side for a few minutes in favour of more immediate practicalities. Mr Young pointed out that some of them didn't really think he was coming anyway, and even when he did turn up, there'd be no guarantee they'd want to go with him. Well, we'll have to wait and see what he's got to offer first. Might be worth our while to barter a little bit. The vicar stood up at this point and declared that there would be no bartering with Jesus Christ. Mr Young said that he thoroughly enjoyed bartering with the Moroccan stall owners when they visited last year, but the vicar said it didn't matter and that all their bartering should really have been wrapped up in prayers in church before the apocalypse had even happened. But we didn't know when to expect it, came Mr Young's sullen reply. I was still making my mind up. The vicar said that the power of the Lord should be felt in your heart and soul and you shouldn't need persuading. Mr Young said it wasn't his fault if Sky had more compelling programming than the pulpit. I think they were secretly beginning to miss Beryl. 
The idea was floated that perhaps they should split the Apocalypse Committee into a further subcommittee entitled the Welcoming Committee, and this would take full responsibility for what they would do when Jesus got there. A buffet seemed like the most logical option, and so the vicar agreed to work with Mrs. Shue and Nigel on planning a menu and looking for a suitable venue. If they could give it a lick of paint, then the village hall would do it a push, but there was a feeling in the room that perhaps Jesus was a little more outdoorsy. Mr Baxter had managed to fall asleep twice by the time they had agreed all this and as they had eaten that week's ration of bourbons they decided to call it a day and reconvene when Mrs Shue and Nigel had an update for the next meeting. Mr Baxter made a hasty exit with his dog as the welcoming committee's conversation turned to Jesus's morally surprising lack of vegetarian persuasion. No one wanted to be caught with just hummus if Staplegrove had hung had sprung for pigs in blankets. End of chapter four. Um, what have you all said now? Uh, dun, dun, dun. Oh yeah, Joelingo's real good, Ruth. I'm agreeing. Um, he what? Yeah, he was a gypsy. It was a West Country accent, so I know I don't have the accent when I talk, just as a general prawn person. But um, I uh, I grew up in Somerset, so Norton Fitzwarren is the village that I lived in until I was 18, um, and I lived there. Yeah, my whole childhood. I'm a full born and bred Somerset girl. I haven't lived there since I was 18 because of there's no infrastructure. Thanks the government. But um, I love it down there. So that's my accent. Right, we'll do chapter five. We'll do another chapter. Why not have three, eh? By day eight, the overwhelming feeling in the village was that something, anything should be happening by now. Even if it was just a small angel, Mrs. Shue could be heard saying to anyone who would listen. It wouldn't even have to have wings. I just don't want to have sacrificed Duncan for no reason. Well, how are you going to know it's an angel if it doesn't have wings? Asked Arthur Arthur as they settled down for the beginning of the meeting. It'd be all glowy, wouldn't it? Came the indignant reply. All glowy? All glowy? stuttered Arthur Arthur equally indignantly. I have never heard such nonsense. And it'd have a booming voice, wouldn't it, Vicar? said Mrs Shue eagerly. She wore the delighted look of a six-year-old answering the day's literary literacy questions before her adult schoolmates. The vicar was sitting with his head in his hands, wondering if the placement at the Croydon Comprehensive would have been less soul-destroying had he opted for that six years ago when the two offers were on the table. Somehow he'd been convinced that a rural position would be more nourishing for the soul after his years of military work. Why did people assume proximity to grass and livestock was healing? Or perhaps it was, if you managed to find a spot without any locals in it. The vicar shook the animosity out of his head. It was the apocalypse talking. These people were his people. Though what that said about him, he wasn't quite sure. And ringlets, continued Mrs. Shue, unabated. That's how you tell apart a prophet from an angel, isn't it, Vicar? We've all seen the windows. Only the angels have ringlets. Well, how on earth would that work, said Arthur Arthur. Do you mean how in heaven? Uh, giggled Martin Young and got a frown and the threat of an old man's backhand for his trouble. What do you get, continued Arthur Arthur. Eternal life, total absolution and a set of wings and a perm. Don't be ridiculous, Iris. I'm not being ridiculous, protested Mrs. Shue. I've seen it in the pictures. It was at this point that the vicar stepped in. Whether or not to prevent a fight or the complete loss of faith in his life's work remains unclear. The lack of intervention by some sort of messenger at this point is unfortunate, he surmised, leaving his chair and pacing towards the dusty window. Sunlight tapered in through the thin glass, illuminating the chipped paint and the cracking lead. There was just never enough money to fix it. That was the problem. Maybe now that the world was over, they might qualify for a grant or something. A prize for being the last flock standing. That was, of course, assuming they were the last flock standing. Maybe there were other villagers just like theirs. Maybe this was just a thinning of the herd. Why were the religious constantly being compared to groups of docile animals? He wished his particular cattle were a little less uppity today. There were only so many inane questions he could handle on a Sunday morning. It's unfortunate, he continued, but hard the end of the world. Nobody laughed. They would have laughed in Croydon, he thought wistfully. It's unfortunate, he continued to continue, wishing no one was narrating his inner monologue so he could finally get to the end of a sentence. It's unfortunate. 
unfortunate, but it might mean that perhaps the Lord is testing us. Perhaps we are meant to be actively seeking our salvation and not just sitting back waiting for someone else to do all the hard work for us. Perhaps this challenge has been sent to test us. But nothing has been sent. I thought that was the problem, said Martin Young slyly. Exactly, chimed in Mrs. Shu. If they'd sent someone, we'd know where we stood. But what we've got is an absence of sending. It's like the bloody, sorry, Vicar, it's like the postal strikes all over again. Well, you make a fine point, Mrs. Shu. Perhaps this is a sign that we should be seeking our own route to the sorting office in the sky. Why sit idly by for the messenger to come to us? <laughs> Were we not, by the grace of God, granted two legs upon which to walk? The vicar was warming nicely to his theme now. Why should we lounge about these heady days, assuming we are worth seeking out for the heavenly kingdom? Hmm. Idly dreaming when we could be learning. Perhaps it is our duty to find the Lord's word ourselves. There was a silence in the room as the group digested his sermon. The vicar hoped fervently that no one had picked up on his repetition of idly. It would never have happened to Clement Freud. He scanned the faces of his congregation for signs of agreement. Eventually, Arthur Arthur cleared his throat. Well, we can't all go. What? We can't all go, can we? Where? To look for this curly-headed angel. What if we all disappear off looking for him, and then he comes here? There'd be no one left to serve the buffet. I thought the buffet was in case Jesus came. What? We're not doing any food for the angel? Seems a tad unfair if he's come all this way. Well, maybe we could just do some cold bits. I'd like to point out that the angel might be a woman. Well, woman, man... One of them ones with the smooth bits, grumbled Arthur Arthur. If we're all gone off on a wild goose chase, then there'll be no one here to meet the messenger of non-specific gender, will there? We could leave a note. The vicar decided now might be a good time to step back in before the conversation turned to which font type an angel of the Lord would most prefer. He simply didn't have the strength to argue the case for Helvetica against a room of people who'd grown up without computers. Perhaps we should just send a select search team, plan a route, send a few of our more able neighbours to scout around, see if they can't unearth the unearthly. <laughs> he really was wasted on these people. Oh, I like that idea, piped up Nigel. That way we cover our backs whatever happens. We look proactive if they do find anything and we settle our minds to getting on with whatever this is if they don't find anything. And so it was agreed they would choose some volunteers to venture out into the surrounding area and collect any wayward deities or celestial minions who might be struggling with the local geography. Clues as to what they should be doing that did not come in the form of a messenger, permed or otherwise, would also be gratefully accepted. Mr Frinton suggested that they start near Ilmin because the bypass always tended to get snarled up. But Arthur Arthur countered that unless there was a heavy convoy of messengers, they're very likely to be able to fly. Perhaps we should wait until we've decided who's going and then see where they're keen to start out, chimed in Mrs Shue, with what seemed frighteningly like more than the usual modicum of sense. They might have already had somewhere in mind for a nice little getaway. Kills two birds with one stone, doesn't it? and the usual order was restored. There you go, that's chapter five. Um, I hope you're having fun. Um, I could go on the arches with that accent. <laughs> Oh, when I was younger, my parents listened to, I mean, everybody's parents listen to the Archers, don't they? Um, but when we were younger, um, sorry, all this touching of the face is not sanctioned, shouldn't be doing it. Um, when we were younger, my parents would always listen to the Omnibus when we were on car journeys. And me and my sister wrote um, a city version of the Archers where they were all farming pigeons. Um, we hated it. Um, Radio 4, yeah, well, I love Radio 4. Oh, by the way, I'll be hosting Radio 4 Extra in a couple of weeks, so I'll give you a shout when that's happening. Um... Do, 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 do. want to listen to the story but all I can do is try and decide whether the glasses are or are not the same colour as the hair well Art Mort um, the hair is many different colours at the moment because it's got roots well it's got natural salt and pepper old lady goodness then it's got roots then it's got like light red then it's got real dark red at the end It it's all sorts of different colour but the glasses are quite fun if not 
half the size of my face. Anyway, that's enough waffle. Um, I hope you've had a lovely time, and um, I'll do some more chapters tomorrow, but keep yourself safe. I hope you're all alright. Bye!